Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, The Millennial Investor, and today we're going over a stock that has been talked about a lot. This is a company that a lot of people have recommended me to buy. It is a dividend stock, and it is one that I currently don't own, and I'm not sure if I'll intend on owning it in the future. But the way things are shaping up, this is one to transition more into a growth company rather than an old and boring dividend company. And the company that I'm talking about is Disney. Disney Plus has been in the news a lot over the course of these last two or three weeks, from laying off 28,000 employees to Dan Lowe wanting to completely just get rid of the dividend and focus all that money towards Disney Plus content, from Disney wanting to reorganize its entire business model, primarily focusing once again on streaming with Disney Plus and Hulu and other sources. And then with Disney, there's also other things as well, like the growth of Disney Plus has been absolutely incredible for Disney. It has hit record numbers. It'd be any estimates that any type of management thought that they would be hitting at this level in the streaming wars with already 60 million subscribers. Now they only expected to have 90 million by 2024 and they're already two-thirds of the way into that goal as of August of 2020 a couple months ago. So now they have even more than 60 million. And then last but not least I want to talk about their theme parks and how they're shifting less and less from this traditional old school business and more into the new age business with things like their streaming services. Now before we go into Disney I just wanted to mention in this video we'll also be going over the new change in my portfolio. You see these two little pieces right here that are underweight and these two jagged ones out right here. I recently lowered my target weight in Discover Financial Services and Waste Management and then raised my percentage in Home Depot and Procter & Gamble. I did not sell out of these companies, that's why they're all jagged like that, but I wanted to increase my position in these two and lower them in these two and I'll be going over my reasonings in that in this email that I wrote out and just give you some of the basic bullet points of why I did that and if you follow along with me in my portfolio, why you should consider doing the same as well. But thank you guys so much for watching, thank you guys for tuning in. If you're not familiar with me, if you're not familiar with my channel. My name is Jordan. I'm the Millennial Investor. I track my annual and monthly dividend income as well as my portfolio value. And here's my monthly YouTube income broken down by category right there. And then I have 27 stocks that I currently own. Disney is not one of them, but out of the 27 stocks that I own, they currently pay me a little bit over $200 a year, and these are the 27 stocks that I own and what they pay me on an annual basis. And if you want to help me and my channel and you want to get signed up for M1 Finance, this is an absolutely great brokerage to use to buy and sell stocks and invest for the long term. This service, M1 Finance, is absolutely free to use. No fees, no commissions whatsoever. This link is in the description, and if you sign up and deposit $100 to the platform, you can get $10 for signing up. We have 46 people signed up. So let's go ahead and see if we can get that to 47, 48. Let's get that up to 50. So thank you guys so much. And there's other things in the description you need to check out as well, including this link to my pie if you want to see it investing in it firsthand. And then if you also want to see other things as well, like Yada Savings accounts, credit card referrals, mentoring ship calls with me, and then other things like that. Thank you guys so much. And we can go ahead and get into the video. But let's go ahead and get into Disney laying off 28,000 employees as coronavirus slams its theme park business. Disney will lay off 28,000 employees across its parks, experiences, and consumer product segment. The company blamed prolonged closure and capacity limits at open parks for the layoffs. While Disney theme parks in Florida, Paris, Shanghai, Japan, and Hong Kong have been able to reopen with limited capacity, both California theme parks have remained shuttered. Now this company has really struggled recently from its theme parks and it is not due to their own fault. It is due to the government having all these rules and regulations restricting them from opening back up their parks. Now if we go to this other article here, coronavirus shutdown cost Disney $3.5 billion, $3.5 billion in theme park operating income in the third quarter. Disney said in the COVID-19 outbreak cost its park experiences and product segment around $3.5 billion in lost operating income in its fiscal third quarter. Now we're not talking about a year, we're not talking about six months. We're talking about in the course of three months, they missed out on $3.5 billion worth of operating income. Revenue for the segment fell 85%. That is a massive drop off in revenue. We're not talking about a 10 or a 20% downturn, 85% downturn in revenue. So how is Disney's share price held up through all these downturns with this recession taking place and the shutdown? We go to Disney stock price here. It currently trades at $126 a share. And over the course of the last five years, it's almost exactly where it was five years ago on a money weighted return. Now this dividend just recently got cut to zero so they could focus on more things like streaming and not have to worry throughout getting this recession and focus on less about the coronavirus and focus more on the future for their theme parks and especially their streaming. 
Now, this company has had some pretty stagnant share price growth over the last five years, but their dividend has not really grown a whole lot either. They only pay out the dividend twice a year instead of quarterly like most companies out there. And now that it's at zero, it's not something that I'm currently interested in owning. But Disney is a stock that I think has an incredible business model. They have their streaming platform. They have their theme parks. They have collectibles. They have movies. They have all different types of ways to create revenue through their awesome characters and awesome storylines that kids and adults, kids and adults, actually fall in love with. Now, when we look at these numbers and we see that revenue fell 85% for their park segment, it has to beg the question, how has their streaming service been doing? When we look at competitors, well, one of the prime examples of this is Netflix. How has Netflix been doing throughout this recession? Well, you can go ahead and see that chart there. They've been doing great. 2020 is the best thing that could have happened for Netflix. Now, I know 2020 is not the best for most people, but for Netflix, it's about the best thing that could happen. Streaming has been taken to the next level thanks to the shutdown from this pandemic. Now, when we look at Disney, they have been held up quite a bit because, unfortunately, their parks make up a large part of their retail business. Now, the streaming is growing, growing rapidly, and let's go ahead and look at some of those growth numbers. The growth for Disney has been incredible. Disney announced Tuesday that Disney Plus surpassed 60 million subscribers. The title of this article is Disney has won the first stage of the streaming wars. On August of 2020, they announced that they already have 60 out of their 90 million subscriber goal by 2024. And one of their investors, Dan Loeb, recently announced that he would rather have their $3 billion in annual dividends focused towards strictly Disney Plus content. Now, this is really interesting because he wants to switch up management and change things. And this was announced on October 7th. Now, if we fast forward to October 12th, five days later, Disney says its primary focus for entertainment is streaming, announces a major reorganization. Disney is restructuring its media and entertainment divisions. In order to further accelerate its direct-to-consumer strategy, the company will be centralizing its media business into a single organization that will be responsible for content distribution, ad sales, and Disney+. The chain comes as the global coronavirus pandemic has crippled its theatrical business and ushered more customers toward its streaming options. Okay. Now, I don't know if it was because of this investor or if it was just management in general, but regardless, I think that this is a good thing for Disney. What Disney is doing is offering their streaming service for pennies on the dollar. You can buy Disney Plus for only a couple bucks a month and then share that with multiple family members. Now, what they're wanting to do is pretty much the same thing that Netflix did in the beginning. They're wanting to grow the platform as quickly as possible. They are not focused on making profits. They are focused on growing subscribers because then once they get a large enough demand for those subscribers from their streaming platform, they can then turn around and then just raise the price. Because once you have 100 million, 200 million, 300 million subscribers, if you raise the price by just $1, $2, $3 a month, you're looking at hundreds of millions or even in Disney's case, billions of dollars worth of pure profit with absolutely no extra overhead and i think that disney should absolutely focus on creating new content now one of the ways that netflix dominates over disney is for one reason and that is the fact that they kind of have the shotgun approach and that they come out with as much content as possible some of it's really good some of it's really not but the point is there's so much content out there that you can pretty much always find something new to watch practically every single day they're coming out with new content every single day now, Disney, while their content is really high quality, a lot of their content is really old school. A lot of stuff that you've already seen, a lot of stuff that has already been seen over the course of the past couple of decades or just some revamped films. But there's nothing really that is very exclusive to Disney with the exception of a couple films and a couple shows. If they were to expand that catalog and make hundreds of films and TV shows that were only exclusively available on Disney+, Plus, I think that would really drive subscriber growth and really make people want to stay subscribed to it. So overall, I think this is a good move for Disney, and I think the stock definitely has some upside potential from here. And considering all of what they have, while their theme parks are struggling, they do have an excellent business model, and I think this is pretty undervalued considering the level of where it's at right now. But let's go ahead and go back to my portfolio. And let's look at the two stocks that I raised and the two stocks that I lowered in my portfolio. Now, if you see here, I'm focused on dividends. I'm not focused on share price. I focus on my annual dividend income and my monthly dividend income being my top two right here on these charts that I focus on. I don't really focus so much on the portfolio value. That's more for a cosmetic appeal for you guys watching so you can see the growth. And then also my monthly YouTube income. I show this 
primarily for one, my own finances, and two, just for full disclosure. I don't want to hide anything from you guys. Buys, sales, dividends, money I make from the channel, anything whatsoever, I want to show any and everything that happens on the channel, right? Now, when we look at these stocks, when we look at the four, let's go ahead and search these four tickers. Waste management, if we look at just the share price, right? It's nearly back to all-time highs from its recession. Let's go to Discover Financial Services. Discover has still got a long way to recover from getting back to its all-time high. But the two that I just bought into, Procter & Gamble, is at well above its all-time high, soaring past previous all-time highs in early 2020. Let's look at Home Depot. Its business model is thriving. 2020 has treated it very nicely, and this is once again at all-time high. So you might be asking yourself, Jordan, why are you bumping up these positions right now while they're at all-time highs? Well, I'll go ahead and give you my reasons behind this, and I'll go ahead and give you some bullet points to look at these four stocks and give you my reasons for bumping up Home Depot and Procter & Gamble. Now, let's go ahead and go here. Let's look at the dividend yield. If we look at the dividend yield, which once again, I don't know why, M1 Finance is always just a little bit off, but the dividend yield for waste management is 1.89%. The dividend yield for Discover Financial Services is 2.75%. Procter & Gamble's dividend yield 2.2 and Home Depot's dividend yield is 2.09. So the average between these two, if you take the average of these two and the average of these two, they're almost identical. So my dividend yield for this change in my portfolio didn't really change hardly at all, not really whatsoever at all. But if we scroll down and we keep on going further here, let's look at PE ratios. The PE ratios are really similar as well with the exception of Discover. Waste management forward PE ratio. I like to look at forward PE ratio. I think trailing 12 months PE ratio don't really give you a full side of the company because it doesn't really matter what the company did over the last 12 months. It's about what they're going to do over the next 12 months. So I like to look at forward PE ratio. I think it gives you a better idea of the direction and the overall movement of where the company is going. The waste management has a forward PE ratio of 26.39. Discover Financial Services, 10.30. Now, the reason Discover Financial Services is so low is because they are in the financial sector, specifically focusing on credit cards because credit cards get hit really hard in recession, so there is a risk there. But let's go ahead and look at Procter & Gamble and Home Depot. About the same as that is waste management, 26.74 and 24.33 is Home Depot's. Now, these are very similar to that of waste management. So there has to be more than this because I can't just be buying and selling stocks strictly based off of the forward PE or strictly based off of the dividend yield. I have to think about the companies, their defensiveness, their dividend yield, their payout ratio, their growth, and just the overall company in general. So let's go ahead and give you some of the cons as to why I'm lowering my target position in waste management and discover financial services. And then after that, I'll give you my pros for bumping up my position in Procter & Gamble stock and Home Depot stock. Now, cons of waste management and Discover Financial Services include both had revenue declines from the recession. Now, like all stocks, pretty much all stocks, no matter which ones you look at, pretty much went down during the recession, like 95% of stocks. This includes waste management. This includes Discover Financial Services. This includes Procter & Gamble. This includes Home Depot. But regardless, let's go ahead and look at waste management, for example. Waste management has been hit very hard, but the reason why they hit hard was because not only was the stock market going down, but it was also because their business model did get hit hard from all the commercial activity that waste management got from things like restaurants and businesses and things like that. Now, Discover Financial was hit hard as well. And I'm not talking about their share price. I'm talking about their business model. That's the reason that they went from an $83, $84 stock all the way down to in the 20s, in the $20 a share. A huge downturn for Discover Financial Services, right? And the reason why they got hit so hard is, like I said, their main business is banking and credit cards and stuff like that. That gets hit very hard during recession, and financials usually don't get the type of valuations that a lot of these other companies do. But let's go ahead and look and compare that to Procter & Gamble and Home Depot. Procter & Gamble is benefiting from stay-at-home trends. People are still buying shampoo. People are still buying napkins and Kleenex and paper towels and stuff like that. And with Home Depot, they're having the best time of their lives. Their business has been thriving from this recession. People stay at home? Okay, well, we might as well upgrade that home while we're stuck at home, right? And so when we look at the other companies, Waste Management and Discover Financial Services, let's go ahead and go to WM. Waste Management has a dividend yield that is now under 2%. About 1.8, 1.9% is the dividend yield. So it's really hard for me to get excited about this company when my dividend yield for my portfolio currently yields about 3.5% based off these levels. And it yields under 2. So that's really hard to get excited about there. 
Discover Financial Services is forced to halt its dividend. Now, Discover Financial Services was due for a dividend raise, but just flat out, the Fed won't let them. They're extending their restrictions until the end of 2020, so we know that they won't be raising their dividend in 2020. Let's see if they'll raise in 2021, who knows? But that puts a big question mark for me as an investor. Still a great company, still a great yield, not one to sell out of it, but buying new shares should probably get hit the brakes a little bit. Should probably slow down a little bit from where it's at right now. Now, Discover Financial Services is more volatile during downturns. Now, during any downturn, including the 2020 recession, let's go ahead and look at this. Like I said, $85 a share, $86 a share, all the way down to about $25. That is a massive downturn during this recession and fell way more than the traditional S&P 500. This stock will continue to be volatile during recessions because they just get hit so hard. Financials get hit so hard during recessions, and this one is no exception. Now, let's go ahead and go to the next one. Dividend track records are shorter. In the same way that this company skipped raising its dividend, it doesn't have nearly as long as a growth track record as a lot of my other companies. The same thing with waste management. It's been growing its dividend the past decade or so, but it doesn't have nearly the track record that Procter & Gamble and Home Depot does. They have been raising their dividends much longer. And then last but not least, Discover Financial Services at a significantly different valuation from original purchase. If we go to my activity feed here, and we go all the way back to my first purchase right here. And we find Discover Financial Services. I'm going to find it right about there. Okay, Discover Financial Services, I started buying for under $30 a share. I bought it for $29 a share. And if we compare that to today's prices, it currently trades at 63. It is over double the price I initially bought it at. When I originally was buying the stock, I was buying it on April 3rd of 2020. I bought it for $29 a share. Now it is over double that price. So not that the valuation is bad, not that this company's gone to the ground, not saying you shouldn't buy it, but from where I was originally buying it at, the only reason why I was so bullish on this company is that I looked at it, and while I'm not so big on Discover Financial Services, I do like the company, I thought, wow, $29 a share? This thing is a steal. I've got to buy it. And that's why this company has over doubled in share price from the time I originally bought it. So this is not the same stock that I was buying six months ago. Now let's go ahead and go to the pros of Procter & Gamble and Home Depot. Both had revenue increases from the recession. Now, once again, the stay-at-home trends are in their favor, which is the next bullet point. The stay-at-home trends are both beneficial for both of these, and that goes for both Procter & Gamble and Home Depot. Like I said, they sell a lot of your basic home items that you take for granted. A lot of things like Huggies diapers and skincare products and deodorants and tissues and paper towels and all types of stuff like that. A lot of their products are things you don't even consider buying. They're very consumer defensive, right? You buy these no matter what your income looks like because you're going to buy these regardless of whether you make $20,000 a year or you make $200,000 a year. These are products that everybody buys. Now, Procter & Gamble has more people staying at home, so more people buying toiletries and skincare products and things like that. Now, when we look at Home Depot, the same scenario. Like I said, a lot of these hard labor, blue collar workers have been forced to stay at home and they have been driven crazy, out of their mind, bored at home, stuck at home, not being able to work, just getting paid unemployment and getting a stimulus check on top of that. So now they don't have a job. They're stuck at home. They have some extra disposable income from the form of stimulus checks and unemployment. So what are they going to do with that? They're stuck at home. They're laborers. They might as well upgrade their home. And even if they're not a blue collar worker, people just generally like to improve their home. And that's why the long term trend for Home Depot has been incredible over the last five years. This company going from $125 a share all the way up to pretty much $300. Now this company has been benefiting a lot from these stay at home trends. And I think that especially for Home Depot, this is not going to stop anytime soon. I think this is going to continue to trend upwards and I think that this company is going to be very defensive over the next five years and have some incredible dividend and share price growth. Now both of these stocks are quote recession proof. Now these companies have such great track records and are so defensive that they can pretty much weather any storm. No matter what the market does I can never really see a scenario where Procter & Gamble goes down 80 percent. I can't really see much of a scenario where Home Depot goes down 90%. I don't really think that's possible. These companies are so defensive that a lot of people refer to them as recession proof, and I would pretty much agree with that statement. Procter & Gamble has a lower beta than that of the traditional S&P. Now, while Home Depot might get hit pretty hard from the recession, just like any other stock, Procter & Gamble, I really like it for one reason and one reason only. 
it is extremely defensive. You see the share price only went from 127 down to about $97 a share. Didn't go down nearly as much as the traditional market did like the S&P. And this has held true through pretty much out all recessions from 1987 to 2000, 2009, 2020. And I think that trend will continue to happen with its cult-like investors. People are very stubborn, very favored towards this company. And they pretty much are long-term investors that aren't selling out pretty much no matter what. Now, last but not least, dividend track records are incredible. Go ahead and do me a favor. Rather than me look it up, go ahead and look at the dividend streaks of Procter & Gamble and Home Depot. And I think you will be shocked at how long these companies have not only been paying dividends, but raising dividends. So if you just look at those track records with the awesome growth, I think that will probably convince you by itself alone. But thank you guys so much for watching if you made it all the way to the end. Like I said, if you want to support me, if you want to follow along with me in my investing journey, if you want to watch me update these charts every single month, all four of these, and be fully transparent while doing it with disclosing things like YouTube income, my dividend income, my portfolio, all different types of stuff like that, as well as my 27 holdings, I'd invite you to subscribe. Follow along with me and you can watch me update these charts. And like I said, if you made it this Far, if you made it all the way to the end if you want to support me you want to support the channel go ahead and use this referral link it's down in the description as well as lots of other things down in the description as well as well as referral links to like see my portfolio to invest in it yourself credit card referrals you ought to savings accounts mentoring calls i do a mentoring calls do all that check all that stuff out thank you guys so much for watching ask me any questions you have down below in the comment section and i'll speak to you guys next time